which will set a benchmark for standards needed in English language arts and mathematics. But let me tell you why Common Core is important. For the first time in American history, we will have an assessment uh, uh, template for mathematics and English and English language learning that's benchmarked to the best international standards. And so when my board says we want to make sure we're good as Florida, but we're not competing against Georgia and Texas. So we're not even the time is now that the library, writing center, and tutoring conference will all be closing in 15 minutes at 8 o'clock. And they have 15 minutes for writing. <laughs> Germany and America are the only two industrialized nation, nations where the population currently will be our less educated than the women of the students. The only two nations. Those provide challenges. So the board says we have to be well uh, versed to make sure our kids are ready for international standards to compete. Common core standards, that's the benchmark. We're also a part of PARC, the Partnership for Assessing Readiness for Colleges and Careers. In fact, we're a governing board member and a fiscal agent. Most uh, 25 states, which I would include D.C. in there. And our goal is to make sure that our assessments are aligned with Common Core because 2014 50, different assessments before across the board. And so we met with uh, 300 teachers uh, last summer, uh, met together for a week, and came up with assessment standards for reading and mathematics. And then that led to an assessment with several superintendents. The, uh, your superintendent was not a part of that. Sam was there. Uh, Sam seemed to show up at all the places where their assessment conversation is. <laughs> it's good to see him because you need someone who's an evangelist uh, in this work. And we talked about scores. Now, remember, there are 30 grades in reading, or 40 grades in reading and 30 in mathematics. There was agreement on 38 of the 40. There was this concern about grades for uh, achievement scores for grades 9 and 10. In mathematics, you have 30. There was a meeting on 29. There was a split on, on algebra. But lo and behold, the media and others chose to focus on two grades, very important grades, 9 and 10, for a host of reasons. But we didn't celebrate the fact that there was agreement that between 3 and 8 in reading, 3 and 8 in math, that we had agreement and assessments were in line. But with those assessments being in line, we also accepted that there was going to be a decline in achievement. It's not a shock. When you raise the standards, as we've seen in Florida for a decade, you see a peak, you see a change in standards, you see a decline, and within a few years, you see the curve uh, or the, or the, or the uh, template moving in the right direction. We'll see that again. Writing is a little different. We're in a lot of conversations. We're in cut score conversations. Those will actually take place in the fall. And so when students in fourth grade, for example, move from 80% to 27%, and I saw that information, I knew immediately students did not suddenly write badly or incorrectly in 11 months. Instead, there were changes to standards, which we did not communicate as well as we should have. Had a letter on July 5th. I'm sure people had a great July 4th weekend, had a great time. We had something on the website, 29th, we had five regional meetings in October. But it wasn't enough, and that won't happen again, I can tell you that as your commissioner. But what the board decided to do was to take that consideration some say that we lowered the standards. Quantitatively, a move from four to three is a decrease. But guess what? At three, there were two readers. You didn't even have that before. And you also had a level of rigor that you didn't have before. Quantitatively, a decrease by one point, but qualitatively, an improvement across the board. And so the students in the fourth grade, when they take the exam in 10th grade, we're not going to see 38% at 4.0, if that is the level. And we'll have that achieve a point. But for me, this is a, uh, an opportunity for us to have good dialogue about where we're going in the future. 1415 is a different Florida, but more importantly, our children are inheriting a world that's very different. I'll end by sharing with you information provided by a global report card. Uh, Jay Green is a researcher at the University of Arkansas. Uh, he and I were actually part of a research team at Arkansas some years ago. He's done a lot of research on Florida. Uh, he and a gentleman with the Arnold Foundation in Texas created a global report card. Uh, and they used similar data. You had to have to be a country with at least 2 million people. You needed a uh, gross domestic product of at least uh, per, per capita of 25,000. So you had Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, 
other countries. He said, let's have a conversation about how badly our poor students are doing. We always hear that. How are our middle class students doing? Those from areas where there's a high income. One example was Beverly Hills. The median income there was 101,000. I'm from Los Angeles. I know a lot about Beverly Hills. In fact, you always you know about Beverly Hills because of shows uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. But you never see a show of Lifestyle of the Poor and Unfortunate. You never see that. And part of it is we want to see how well people are doing. So 101,000 uh, income on average. Predominantly Anglo, 4% Asian, 2% African American, 4% Hispanic. Next door is Los Angeles. Very different demographics. Very different income. Someone said, wow, Beverly Hills is doing much better than Los Angeles. And Beverly Hills pound for pound has more money. Therefore, if you have more money, you'll do well. And then if you take Beverly Hills with the examples and the research from uh, the Global Report card, take Beverly Hills and you put it in Sweden or you put it in Finland, it's a very different story. Comparatively, while they're doing well in the United States on mathematics, nearly 54% uh, of their students are doing well on international standards. You move them to other countries, you move it from the 50s to the 40s and in some instances to the 30s. So the conversation isn't only about the lower income, it's about the middle class and the wealthy families who still invest in public education because many of them need to make sure that we see the global picture. The board's decision and my support of what they do is to prepare Florida for high standards, prepare Florida for international competition, to prepare them for colleges and careers. A third of our graduates goes directly into the workforce. Many of us go to our fine, uh, go to our fine 28 uh, Florida college system institutions, our 11 state university systems, or many of our private schools, historically black colleges. Colleges and careers are different. My stepdad, like many uh, who left the South after World War II, moved to California looking for good jobs and benefits. He was an airplane wing mechanic. He worked 47 years for the same company. I will, be, I will work 47 years in education, but not for the same company. And he retired, he was proud. He used a working class, uh, income to raise a family and send a number of us uh, to different parts of a professional endeavor. He had a high school diploma, but guess what? My dad today, working with was then Lockheed, now Lockheed Martin, my dad stepped back today, couldn't get that job with a high school diploma alone. Doesn't mean he should get a college degree. We have great CTE academies that will prepare students who come out with skills, Microsoft certification and others. So the standards are raised uh, while we focus sometimes on the hiccups in the process, let's always keep our eyes on the main idea, which is the product, that our students are ready to inherit a floor that is very different. I'd like to thank uh, your superintendent for the spirited conversation we had. I would say at the last board meeting, we had a conversation about the task force. There were two recommendations that she put on the table that actually made it into it because it made a lot of sense. Uh, so I thank her for that. I also thank her for uh, the conversation you had. I also thank Sam. I also thank uh, a couple of lawmakers who had a chance to speak to. So you had a chance to uh, uh, acknowledge or recognize our, our state board chair, Kathleen Shanahan, uh, who, unlike many state chairs in the country, brings a nice, strong business focus and an education focus to this job and wants to make sure we do well. This is her home, and so I want to invite her up to say some words.